Welcome to Get a Better Handle on Life. I'm Barry Winbolt, and this is my podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking to Seymour Jacklin, mastermind, writer, and narrator behind the podcast Stories from the Borders of Sleep. Hello, Seymour. How nice to be speaking to you. Hello, Barry. <laughs> We're going to be finding out all about your podcast, but I think there's a greater story behind that, which you as a modest person probably need drawing out of you. But let's start by, um, could you give me a quick explanation of the podcast? Okay, my podcast is called Stories from the Borders of Sleep. It's short fiction. It's mostly fairy tales that I've written that sort of I suppose in terms of genre, think Alice in Wonderland, think uh, sort of metaphysical whimsy. There's a lot about nature, a little bit of magical sparkle thrown in. Uh, A lot of the original stories are actually drawn from dream material. So when I started podcasting back in 2011, a lot of the ideas for the stories were coming from dreams that I'd had and Hence the title of the podcast, Stories from the Borders of Sleep. Or they were sort of delved from the kind of hypnagogic state that one is in as one drifts off to sleep or wakes up, where imagination and reality sort of uh, mesh, as it were. How do you capture those thoughts? Because we all know, I'm sure we've all experienced the, had the experience of a, a brilliant idea in that hypnagogic state, as you mentioned, only to find that it's incredibly elusive once we've woken up. I probably lose 80% of the ideas, but there's enough gold in the 20% that I do reclaim. I mean, I habitually, I guess from the age of 11, I've kept a dream diary. And there's something about that that enhances your ability to remember dreams. Either I'll recover the dream at some point in the day because something's prompted it, or I will remember on waking up and try to write down at least a few key words. Well, I know from having worked with a colleague who worked in the area of sleep many, many years ago, that he trained himself through keeping a sleep diary. Yes. To be able to um, remember. It's an absolutely fascinating thing. And if you delve into the arts, literature and you know the visual arts, how much of an influence dreams have historically been and how many of our favourites actually drew on that kind of material and had similar practices. I wish I could remember the name of the guy, but there is a chap who who wakes up without waking up every night and paints. And then he properly wakes up in the morning and sees what he's painted. And it's extraordinary. Yes, I just checked while we've been speaking. His name is Lee Hadwin uh, from Croydon in South London. Yes. Well, I mean, it's uh, certainly a seem to be mind in terms of creativity. I developed the idea when I was writing books more that I would not do any revision the night before. I wouldn't sit in bed and read tomes on psychology. But what I would do was read a significant paragraph and then go to sleep. And I would wake up anything between four and six in the morning and I really wouldn't have to work at it. And I did that for five years with a blog as well. So every morning I'd wake up and just write a blog post with no planning. I mean, sleep's one of the last frontiers, isn't it? I think it's still mysterious to science. And yet we have, we're almost rediscovering what a lot of indigenous cultures have known since forever, you know, the importance of dreams, or they've got, there are lots of dreaming cultures that are much more around where it's a family thing to sit down in the morning and share what you dreamt about and to draw significance from it. And obviously dreams feed into psychotherapy so effectively. And I often wonder whether this is, um, you know, what goes on in these indigenous cultures is, is a form of psychotherapy. It's, and they've known about it for thousands of years. Yeah, well, there's so much depth in there uh, into our psyche that without getting all psychoanalytic about this, there's just, we are told, we use, use such a small proportion of our minds that it's a good idea to 
consider the idea that there may be something in the sort of hinterland yeah. that we can draw on. And you've, you've done that with Stories from the Borders of Sleep with your podcast. And I noticed that the subtitle is Curious Tales and Fantastic Fables. Can you say something about, did you start, I know it's got sleep in the title. Yeah. Did you start out with the idea of doing something therapeutic and supportive with it, or was it just an outlet for your writing? It was the latter, very much. Um, I didn't start with any intention other than to fool around uh, and put something out there. Um, and in, in many ways, that was the easiest ticket to go in on, because if you're not conscious of having an audience or a sense of responsibility towards them, you you know you, it, you can be freer creatively. But when as I as the listenership grew and I got feedback, it was clearly becoming a total magnet for insomniacs. Uh, there's something about my voice that is soothing, and I think it's the combination of the kind of whimsical, otherworldly sort of narratives combined with my voice that have really really clicked with a lot of people so the most consistent feedback i get is people rely on it you know to go to sleep or to get back to sleep if they find themselves waking up in the middle of the night um and so i've embraced that and i suppose it feeds into you know i've been there myself i'm a part-time insomniac as well and i've had a journey with that so um it's wonderful to feel that there's a community around that this sort of twilight zone uh, that I'm giving back to and getting a lot of support and encouragement from as well. Yes, there's nothing like customer feedback or yeah. audience recognition to help, to, to motivate us, to keep yes. us going. Obviously, as the, as the audience has grown, it's come with a greater sense of responsibility. You are talking to people in that state between waking and sleeping which is a state of vulnerability and I think with that I've, I've begun to take a lot more care over the content and the presentation because you're you know it's it should be soothing it shouldn't be triggering it, it needs to have the desired effect and that has been a challenge in itself from the writing point of view. Looking at it from the hypnosis perspective, it's also a phase when one is suggestible. Yes. And can take ideas on board more easily. We can learn yeah. some things more easily, but equally. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating to hear you say that because I've, you know, I've long suspected there's a little bit of an overlap with uh, with hypnosis. And I guess, as a result, I tread very carefully. <laughs> That takes us off course a little bit, but mm -hmm. your story behind you, mm. you know, is I, you said a couple of things to me the other day when we were talking about this. I remember thinking that you had a very interesting story. You mentioned that you didn't sleep very well mm -hmm. earlier in your life. Was there anything else that sort of set you up? Because you're a writer as well, aren't you? Yes. It's not just about yes. podcasts. Yes, yes. Broadly speaking, writing ties together the variety of things I do in life, <laughs> really. I'm Barry Winwell, and you're listening to Get a Better Handle on Life. If you're finding this podcast interesting, please support me by sharing this with someone you know, or by following me on any of the usual platforms. Thank you. I've always danced around the care, the therapeutic side of things. Um, I was trained as a psychiatric nurse and in practice for several years. Um, and now I'm, I'm sort of taking a blended approach where I'm, I'm writing both for industry and for care settings. And, you know, that goes to copywriting, policy work, training, all kinds of different pies yeah sleep has has been a massive theme with me personally and I think that's why the knob of a lot of my work is ends up being around that it was a battle field since childhood um, and I think there's elements of both nature and nurture in that um, and it I've always been a, a bit of a warrior you know an anxious person Again, nature and nurture, <laughs> there'll be a mixture of explanations there. 
Um, and I, this kind of culminated in 2017, so a few years ago, with me experiencing uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So that's where your airways collapse during sleep and you're, you're left gasping for breath um, and you wake yourself up repeatedly. And I had it so severely that when I actually did, eventually did the sleep test, realized what was going on and, and got tested, it was happening 90 times an hour. And 30 times an hour of asphyxiation is high. <laughs> so I was told that, you know, at its peak, it was happening 90 times an hour. And it's, I mean, your air, your air supply is being cut off. It's, it's like having your, um, having your head held under the water throughout the night while you're trying to sleep. Um, as a result, sleep became an extremely anxious time. And my quality of sleep was was almost nil. You know, it was the, the, the level of sleep deprivation that I experienced was exceptional to the point where I was hallucinating during the day as well as falling asleep on the stairs or, you know, in very <laughs> uncomfortable positions and at work and so on. And of course, it you know, became a running joke, but it wasn't funny at all uh, that I could not stay awake during the day. And I suppose... Um, you know, it was fascinating for me coming from a mental health point of view, because I remember during my nurse training, we were explained the um, the stress vulnerability model of, of mental illness, where under duress, any organism eventually experiences psychosis. And they've, um, you know, they've seen this with, you know, people with deprivation, sensory deprivation, um, extreme temperatures or uh, solitary confinement, those kind of conditions, ultimately we will have a psycho psychotic symptom symptomology. And I was, um, I was hallucinating food that I thought I was eating. My, my wife's got camera footage of me putting invisible food in my mouth. It was, it was crazy stuff. D doors would appear in walls where they shouldn't have been. I would hear people saying things that they weren't saying. Um, and so uh, interesting, <laughs> self and very serious state to get in, but very interesting to, to test the stress vulnerability <laughs> hypothesis myself um, and to see how that, that happens um, and to, to know what it's like to, to experience psychosis, I suppose. The lasting effect, of course, of, of that kind of experience of a having the you know your organs starved of oxygen, particularly the brain, which is the hungriest of all our organs when it comes to oxygen, um, is just lasting effects. So, very very high risk, you know, comorbidity with heart disease, um, control of blood sugar, I mean, it, the, the, what comes along with sleep deprivation and not just um, obstructive sleep apnea, but any level of sleep deprivation is just enormously resounding consequences for the organism in general, for us. And I feel that, uh, you know, I've still been, it, it's now 2024, I'm still recovering. I'm still on a curve of coming back from that. Um cognitively I've never quite been the same and I know interestingly you know some people have experienced this since Covid as well um, they're sort of not quite recovering their memories as effectively uh, slower thinking not quite as sharp as they were and it really does feel as if the treadmill was sort of uh, the incline was increased by a few degrees and everything has been harder since that um, so as a result, yes, a good night's sleep has just emerged to me as so fundamental that I would say a lot of my life, a lot of my choices are formed around prioritizing that because if it's off whack, everything is off whack. Uh, Self-regulation, impulse control, eating, <laughs> uh, uh, cognitive ability it all it's it, it all gets dragged in 
I'm, as I'm listening to you, I mean, thank you very much. That's a very honest and uh, revealing account. And I've spoken, obviously, in my work to quite a few people about sleep, but they've usually been practitioners. What you've explained is opening doors in my mind about other things. I'm wondering about the rise in our society of what I can only call is dysfunctional abnormality in children in terms of behaviour and so forth. Because nobody's ever mentioned that. And yet one of my first questions when I'm seeing clients as a therapist is, how do you sleep? It's kind of almost a red flag issue because that's what we're going to deal with first, whatever the presenting complaint. And of course, you know, if if little ones aren't getting the sort of rest they need, they may be sleeping, but if they're not getting the quality of sleep they need at a developmental time, and of course I'm theorising, I have no right to say all this, but this is just a chat between us, and it just got me thinking just to, as one example. So... Where, how did you overcome that, or what was the switch? What was the difference between then and now? Obviously, getting the right kind of treatment for sleep apnea was a turning point. So, I used, I started using CPAP, which is positive airway pressure. You wear a face mask during the night, and it keeps your airways open with a stream of air. Immediately, I got most of my life back. You know, I was able to start functioning again. So that was enormous. And thankfully, I'm one of the people who can tolerate that. Uh, you would imagine that sleeping with something stuck on your face would be actually you know, very, very difficult. And I know a lot of people struggle to adjust and have to find other solutions, but it worked for me. So was that a question of through using that appliance for long enough, you kind of re-educated yourself, something changed physiologically in, t in you so that eventually you didn't need it? Well, the expectation is that you would have to stay on it um, because uh, the, the physical issue of your airways collapsing doesn't really go away. There's a genetic component for it, but it can also be related a lot to inflammation, um, some neurological, some some neurological causes and um, and weight as well. So if you're overweight or obese uh, or carrying extra weight, particularly around the neck, then it affects you. Again, if you lose some of that weight, and I have done, and I have also uh, learnt which foods or, or behaviours tend to cause inflammation. You know, I, I found that if I eat... If I consume wheat, I I swell up <laughs> internally. So it puts everything under pressure a lot more. And, you know, things like that that I was completely unaware of. Uh, so through looking after myself and really, really majoring on my own health, which thankfully, I suppose, I've made it a priority. I thought there's no point in, in doing this by halves if it means that my life's just going to be shorter because there's quite a few things I want to do in life still. Um, and that was a, a strong motivation. So I'm not reliant on that treatment anymore. But you are told when you start it that you probably will need it for the rest of your life. Um, I think that can be challenged, I think. But m everybody is different. And I suppose it's just so important when talking about sleep and that there's no one size fits all for anybody. And um, a lot of the people I talk to who struggle with insomnia, they've tried all the advice that's out there around sleep hygiene, you know, and I think if you do an internet search of, of, of how can I sleep better or, or sleep problems, you're told the same things, you know, banish screens from your bedroom, turn the thermostat down a bit, have a settled routine in the evening it it doesn't go far enough and it doesn't work for everybody and I, you know i i've had conversations with people who've got to that desperate i've done everything they tell me to do and i am still struggling so what do you do when you've tried everything so coming back to your excellent podcast then how do the two worlds link the story, the narrative story, whatever we're saying, you've just given me about your incredible experiences with sleep apnea and coming out of that as much as I guess one can, 
as you said, it's a, it's an uphill thing still going on a bit. And and then you've got this responsibility you feel to your audience in your writing. So you're writing from your creative you, which is something you have a gift for, but you've got this thing perched on your shoulder that's whispering in your ear about your responsibility. I th- try not to overthink it because, again, overthinking shuts down the, the spontaneity of things. But one of the things that a lot of people report is the racing mind uh, keeping them awake, you know, stopping them from falling asleep or waking them with anxiety at the classic three o'clock, four o'clock wake up. And the racing mind is the problem. The mind needs to be stilled. It needs to be taken away. And I think that I deliberately provide an activation for the imagination, uh, a kind of, it is whimsical. It does take people from where they are and move them into uh, away from thoughts. And nothing bad really happens in the stories. It's, it is purely soothing. I think it invokes for many uh, childhood and being read a bedtime story. And I think we have some, many people will have early imprinting of that as a comfortable, safe passage into sleep from childhood. And I think there's a big part of it that invokes that. Certainly for me, uh, stories, um, being in fantasy on the point of going into, into sleep, you know, it was a guarantee of a good night, really. And I I think that is being invoked as well. So, you know, I had my own experience. And I think the way that I often would treat myself is I would tell myself stories. You've reminded me that when I was a child, and it would have been probably from the age of eight to about 12, I would tell myself sagas you know mm. these, these were ongoing stories they quite often featured me as a hero absolutely yeah that's good <laughs> something something around very often featured around animals because i was crazy about nature and animals and you know i could name every british bird and half the <laughs> plants and every fish and all of that stuff i can't now yeah but uh, that was my absolute abiding passion and I would, I felt always, I've always felt since then a slight embarrassment because I was embarrassed at the time. Oh, if people thought, I was physically talking out loud right? to myself, yes. but very quietly about these stories and acting out the stories in some cases. Mm-hmm. And it was, I loved it. Mm-hmm. I would look forward to bedtime because I knew I could continue the story. And I never, knew, I never had a map for the story. Sure. It just was there, and uh, it was a solace, I suppose. I wasn't going through an unhappy childhood. I was, it was fine, but um, it was just another world. So that idea of creating a space is a lovely one. I think fundamentally life is really brutal. I don't think anybody escapes from that. Um, and our imaginations, historically, you know, we've relied on myths to give us a vision of something else and to feel more than we are. Um, And stories invoke exactly the same kind of circuitry as it were. And I I feel it's fundamental to us. Using our imaginations is fundamental to our mental health, you know, and to to being human. And to our development and, and absolutely to our ability to think and navigate our way through the crap that life show, throws at us, basically. And I think you can see that in people when you meet them, that some people just have never really allowed themselves to explore that side of their nature or their character. It's all very material and about what exists. Yeah, and that's conditioning, I think, because naturally we're storytellers, aren't we, naturally? But we, we're, t- we're taught not to. Another door it's knocking on in my mind is... You know, maybe as therapy, we just need to send people on imagination courses and teach them to actually live in a fantasy world a certain amount. Because after all, that's what we're doing a lot of the time. You said negativity. You know, we create entire sagas and and fantasy stories about the harm somebody's done to us, for example. And it all happens in our mind and Mm -hmm. they possibly don't even know we exist. Yes. 
You're listening to Get a Better Handle on Life with me, Barry Winbolt. And that's the blessed mind trying to its best to look after you. You know, it is saying danger uh, and, you know, it's being overcautious and it will try at every cost to keep us safe in the moment, If you know, no matter how much it needs to catastrophize and... Yeah, that's the challenge. I mean, it's it's a brilliant organ, but it can run run riot with uh, with its ability to convince you know to to spin narratives. As you well, say. it does its yeah. job over enthusiastically yeah, sometimes. Basically. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, something I'm always saying to people is, you know, you can let your your mind run your life, or you can learn some skills to actually take control of some of that and and make it a, a, a concrete choice about how you think it's not what you think it's how you approach the exercise of thinking that is so often the thing and i think it is a game changer for some people to realize that they they can talk back to their thoughts you know there's two sides to that conversation so the idea of yes answering back just as you would in real life you know one of the metaphors i had years ago was well if a friend came and Every time you opened your front door to them, they chucked a bucket of foul-smelling water over you. How long would it be before you shut the door and learn not to let them in? And yet that's what we do with our thoughts. Precisely, yes. So, look, Seymour, um, what else can I ask about the podcast? We've we've veered away from that, but as ever, it's a very, very... Well, we don't, you know, I, I wouldn't insist that we stay close to the podcast itself um, no but on the other hand it, it has made a difference in people's lives yeah what are some of the things people have said to you for example i think um you know one of the most gratifying kinds of feedback i get is that I, you know, people will say i was having a, a hard time something happened to uh, you know a, a bereavement or something like that uh and this listening to the stories literally got me through that hump um i wish i knew precisely the mechanics of that you know that it could be bottled and <laughs> and franchised or whatever but there is perhaps something in the voice so i love um john denver's song late late night radio where and, I know, and, you know, the shipping forecast, those kind of things that people tune into just for another human voice to be with them in the dark. And the, the loneliness, you know, amplifies everything, doesn't it? So without anything to present an alternative to your thoughts, they become magnified in the darkness. And we know that in semi-sleep, our um, normal ability to challenge thoughts and, and to repress and and monitor is one of the last things that comes online when you wake up um is that you know, inhibition that's the word i'm looking for so you don't have those inhibitions normally you know in in semi-wakefulness and so the middle of the night is a twilight zone and if there can just be another voice another human voice in that place and i think again going back to indigenous societies um there would have been chit chat through the night <laughs> you know it wasn't a lonely place it wasn't the lonely place that we in modern society have made it you, you, families slept much more closely there was always movement going on um there was always a sense that the, the night was alive as well uh, and we've sort of clinically cleansed it <laughs> there's that conversation i've never been able to, to um fully understand one sleep expert tells me one thing and another one tells me another thing. But I've often woken in the night with an idea and my strategy for that has been, OK, I'll use the time. And it's what I recommend to my clients. You know, if you keep waking up, use the time, don't lie there. Um, but for me, for a writer or somebody who's creating stuff or working ideas out, that's invaluable. I have done so much good stuff in one or two hours at some unearthly hour, usually two o'clock in the morning, something like that. Then there's this debate. A friend of mine who's a, a psychologist said to me, yeah, but, you know, in Samuel Pepys' day, they used to get up and have a steak and kidney pudding or visit their neighbours. And I have read this. Yeah. So that we're the only monophasic, in terms of sleep, the only monophasic creature on the planet. Now, I don't know the truth of that, but it suits me to believe it. And I've never panicked about waking up. I just use the time. 
I just found that so liberating, really, and I've never worried about being tired as a result. When you stop worrying about being tired, you feel less tired. Yeah, yeah. The anxiety that comes with it is not, you know, it's a feedback loop. And I, I have to qualify this, I suppose, and say, I know some people suffer terribly, and they'll probably turn this off at that point where I say, if you stop worrying about it, I'm not diminishing or minimising anybody's experience but for me personally well i think there's an aspect in which you know society modern life has put expectations on us to be up at nine and show up and in many ways that works working against some people's circadian rhythms and and you know i was reading an article this morning about uh phasic work patterns so people who are are able to negotiate with their place of work that they will do the bulk of their work after nine o'clock at night because they're a night owl and that that works for them and i've certainly found i'm prey to the the second wind if you find daily life overwhelming and if you sail close to anxiety normally the the night time when everything calms down it is it's your safe place it's quiet the phone is not not ringing you don't have a list of things to do there is nobody screaming there's no noise and it is a safe time so how do you balance that against the need to sleep well if society is demanding that you you show up for work at nine o'clock the next morning you're you're in a, a troubled kind of situation and i think this is what i've taken to heart again i saw i think it was actually a yoga instructor who who put it like this saying if you're not getting enough sleep, you have a toxic lifestyle. And I think often, because we're so work orientated and productivity orientated, and we're in that mindset that we've had since the Industrial Revolution of working to the clock, that is actually, for many people, is a toxic lifestyle. So the question becomes, how can I get, I'm suffering from insomnia, how can I still show up for work? Or I am suffering from anxiety, I am approaching burnout, how can I recover as quickly as possible so that I can get back for work, so that I don't, so that the sick pay doesn't run out or whatever? And that creates a toxic situation. So, you know, <laughs> again, there'll probably be, there might be people who turn off at this point, but I think it's fundamental that we actually start at the lifestyle level and, and we won't crack this. And if we keep going, how can I get back to work? as quickly as possible? How can I go back to functioning how I did before? Because how you're functioning how you did before led to insomnia, stress, burnout, you know, um, rather we need to address it at the lifestyle level. So my challenge, and since my experiences with anxiety, with sleep apnea, have been to shape, start with my life and say, what kind of a life do I need to be leading in order to be healthy? And that has meant that I don't do certain jobs. <laughs> you know, I've had to shape it around that um, and make it a priority. But I, I almost can't stress enough that I think it is fundamental we ask the question about detoxifying at the lifestyle level rather than try to work out how we're going to fit into what society and work kind of is dictating for us. And the more we challenge this, the more we will hopefully shape. And we are seeing shifts in work culture towards a more compassionate and understanding and, uh, and healthier approaches. And it needs to go further. You know, I, could, I applaud every sort of inch that is taken for that. Those are inspirational words. Thank you for that. Seymour, Seymour Jacqueline, it has been a real pleasure speaking to you. Enlightening, therapeutic, uplifting, informative. What more can I say? I can say that the podcast is called Stories from the Borders of Sleep and it's provided, you'll find it from your usual podcast provider. I highly recommend it. I've got help from my border collie here on my lap. She's been, she's been here for the last, very patient because it's been such bad weather that we missed a walk at lunchtime and uh, she's climbing up on me now because she thinks she has permission. Um, so she will be my next thing to do, won't you? Yeah, come on, down now, down. 
Um, so, th- Seymour, really, really a joy. And I can see that, I mean, I think it would be worth having another conversation sometime to see where it went, because if you would be up for that, because you've got such a depth of knowledge and so much. I, absolutely. Ah, just a great. Well, you're a writer, aren't you? But you present your case so well and you present your information so well. So thank you so much for that. Well, I'm I'm glowing from the compliments. Thank you so much, Barry. I appreciate it. I've uh, It's been great to talk to you. I've learned so much from you over the last few years um and so yeah long may it continue let's let's keep talking (laughs) yes let's so thank you very much and uh honestly a pleasure take care thank you okay bye and my thanks to seymour jacklin who writes and presents the podcast stories from the borders of sleep well worth listening to there's a link in the episode notes that's all from me barry wimbock for this episode of get a better handle on life i hope you found today's episode informative and useful if there's anything we missed or something you'd like to know more about email me i'd love to hear from you You can subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also find me on LinkedIn, my website, and at barrywimbolt.com, and now on YouTube. So thank you very much for listening. All the best. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.